This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. And for those of you who've been watching the news about Ukraine, if you're looking to help, check out the Animal Food Bank. They're sending pet supplies. They're helping with the pets that have been left on platforms and left in apartments and have been in shelters. Prices have skyrocketed. They need money and they need dog food and cat food and blankets. But the best thing they need is money so they can buy that stuff. So be kind to Ukraine and check it out, the Animal Food Bank. All right, so... We're here with Dr. Jory again, and I've got some questions for Dr. Jory this time. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jory Vaknik. Thanks for having me, Deb. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I've got a few questions. I heard in the news something quite exciting. Apparently, there's a new drug. I hope I pronounce it right. Rapamycin. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to make dogs live one third longer. Okay, is this really true? Does it sound too good? Yeah, it does. It does. I've heard of rapamycin. So... Where it originally started was in cancer treatment in, in mice. And they found in mice who were genetically modified to develop cancer for research, that giving them this medication staved off the onset of cancer. And they've also started using it. They started using it in heart failure studies. They did, I think the big one in dogs is they did this one study in dogs with um, congestive heart failure. They found that it improved heart function. But it was, you're talking about a small number of dogs in one study. And then depending on how you interpret the data, you can come up with some very interesting conclusions. So if your dog or cat was going to get a heart problem, this might help or cancer. I don't even know that we can say that. Oh, okay. I think we can say that in this study, when animals who had heart failure, mm -hmm. that they saw improvement with them. But you don't know if your dog is going to have heart failure. And this is where the approval process for some of these supplements when they're called supplements and not drugs, they get brought to market because there's really no oversight and they get to make all kinds of claims. And I think this is another one of those times. I mean, I don't want to slam anybody. And I think it's definitely warrants more looking into. I don't think it's out of the mice rat stage yet, really. Okay. And I think what they're trying to do is translate it into human use. But because you can bring it as a supplement without nearly as much oversight, then one of, the, one of the things we found in this particular drug is that the doses they were originally using it, it's not a benign drug. So it could be, it causes altered sugar me metabolism in a lot of these animals, causing lots of high blood sugar and potential diabetes. It affects how your fats metabolized. And so it's not something that's so simple. Now, what they've right. done in the dogs is they found that the lower dose could still produce some of the benefit in the heart disease study. But the question is, we, I think there's more questions than answers. And so what they've done is extrapolated, oh, low dose is good. So you're buying a product. We don't really know if the dose that is in there is going to be effective. All they really want to make sure is that it's not going to hurt the animals. So how much of the medication is truly in there? What are you actually buying? And so I, as you can tell, for this particular medication, more than a little bit skeptical. I think it definitely warrants looking into. But uh, I think there's a lot of hype and not a lot of meat to the science. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Cause I was like, Oh, I want to get my dogs on this child test. I don't want to give my dogs diabetes. No, no, no. Maybe I'll wait till they figure this out. All right. Okay. So quick question about disposing meds. Is it okay? I was once told that most meds after expiry date just get weaker. Is that true? Or should we toss them? A lot of them do are become ineffective. That's the most common thing with them. My feeling with with medications is if you have a medication, really, why do you have anything left over? You should have given it appropriately, so you shouldn't have it, number one. And number two, if you've got it laying around, then I would just take it back to your vet to dispose. The other thing you can do is take it to a pharmacy. What you don't want to do is flush it down the toilet or put it mm -hmm. into landfill because then those things find their way into groundwater. Mm -hmm. So properly disposing of any kind of medication like that is the way to go. Okay. And here's another quick one. I get asked this constantly from, you know, puppy buyers. When is the best age to spay and neuter dogs and cats? Okay, that's another really Chicky. interesting question. We get it asked all the time too. So when we originally, people came up with this number, I don't even know who, long time ago, six months. But for me, the best time to, to spay female dogs or cats, in my opinion, is before their first heat. 
And the purpose of that is to prevent puppies and kittens that are not wanted. That's number mm-hmm. one. Number two, there is the convenience factor for owners not to have to go through a heat, which is, can lead to them getting rid of their pet because they become a huge annoyance. They become prone to uterine infections. And in dogs and cats, spaying them before their first heat reduces the risk of breast cancer almost 100%. After their first heat, it reduces it by 70%, second heat by 60%, and and going down from there. In neutering dogs and cats, the vast majority can also be done before the onset of male characteristics. So again, I use six months as a benchmark because that's usually maturation for some of my small to medium dogs. A study was done at UC Davis a few years ago that linked certain kinds of cancers with early neutering of large and giant breed dogs. Now, but what's early? Is early six weeks like they six do with months, the SPCA? Six months, eight oh, months six before months, okay. maturation. Okay. But here's where the problem with that interpretation of data comes in. They're talking about cancers that occur very rarely. So if a risk of a bone cancer is 0.01% and neutering them young doubles or triples that, so now you're dealing at 0.02%, is it really a risk? Having said that, mm-hmm. if you don't want to run those risks, delaying the neutering of large and giant breed males dogs, there's no harm in it, provided they don't start to develop the male behaviors that people don't want, like roaming, marking, intermale aggression, and things of that nature. So I have no con- real concern about putting off neutering them, provided owners are responsible and don't let their boys run around and start making little puppies or kittens that we then have to deal with. Here's the hard part I have. A lot of the people that come to me from my boarding kennel, have these big, huge, tough dogs, mastiffs, rotty crosses. They call them gladiator dogs or some kind of combo of toughness, 100 pounds or more and, you know, big heads, giant neck, bred for fighting for years. And they want their dog to be a mush bucket. They want him to be like a golden retriever in the house and love the kids and love everybody and be able to go to the dog park and everything. And as a puppy, he is like that. But they also want to delay neuter because they want a big head and a big neck and a macho looking dog. And I try to tell them, you're going to get a macho behaving dog if you're not careful. If we neuter him early, he's never going to have a dog fight and figure out how good he is at fighting. He's, he's never he's, he's not going to learn that this is his special skill, right? And, and we don't want him to know. So, so I get into these arguments with these people. And then, of course, they don't neuter. And two years later, they call me and say, oh, well, he never did it when he was young. We don't understand why he's beating up the neighbor's dog now. Okay, no, no baby picks fights. They know they can't handle it. They wait till they can handle it. Uh, It seems obvious to me, right? It is. It's it's not that they don't know. It's an excuse. (laughs) Delaying the neutering of large and giant breed male dogs is not a bad idea, provided that the appropriate training is in place and that the owners are aware of what the characteristics to watch for. So if they start to develop, you can actually nip it in the bud before it becomes an issue. Because I don't have to tell you, considering your training experience, you know how much harder is it when a male is neutered at six years to oh. try to undo all that. It's, it's even possible. It's next to not. Right. And things like, okay, so if you have an intact male puppy and he is trying to push people off furniture, don't think that's cute. That's not cute. That's the start of it. If he stands on grandma when she visits on her paw or pees on anything she owns, that's not funny. That's a problem. And I know it's really hard because people laugh and they think it's cute. And oh, look, he's hogging the couch. Isn't that funny? It's not going to be funny when he's over 100 pounds and he's growling and he really is owning that couch. And that's what's going to happen. So I do recommend neuter for people who are inexperienced and don't know how to handle this. For people who are experienced, it really depends on the dog. You know, I have stud dogs myself who get along with each other and frolic and play and never have fights. But I really, really pick the right dog for that role. If I pick the wrong dog, I end up having to neuter him at about a year and a half and train him and rehome him because they just can't handle all that testosterone. So it's ve- it's something to really consider, right, Dr. Joy? 100%. And that's with you, with all your decades of experience, you can still pick wrong. So imagine someone yes. who's never had a dog that's and right. it's their first choice. And even if it's a golden retriever, I mean, the number one dog in the United States for aggressive bites is the golden retriever. Having said that, it's also the most popular. So you yeah. kind of have to interpret the data, but there's a reason that they're biting people. And the behavior that you can look at doesn't even have to be overtly aggressive. It's like the dog who comes over to you and starts lifting up your hand with their nose, come pet me. That's still a demanding behavior. It's a dominant dog saying, you will give me attention now. 
And mm-hmm. people don't know to recognize that. So that gets allowed, which then the, then the bar gets moved a little bit more further over. So the dogs gets more leeway, which then results in more having to undo, which makes it very difficult. Yeah, these things are tests. Your dog is testing you. Do I own the couch? Oh, I own the couch. Do I own my toys? Mm-hmm. Is my food area a no-go zone for everyone else? Like, you got to answer those questions. No, nope, you do not own the couch. Nope, we walk through here whenever we want. You have to teach your dog these things. So, okay, well, we can talk about that on a future show, but we're going to go to a break and come back, and I'm going to ask you about pet food and doggy Alzheimer's later in the show. So stay tuned, everybody, to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, we're back with Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. And I watch the commercials just like everybody else, where the dog food company, they show their product and then they shame their competitors and they tell why their product's so much better. And then they show these cute dogs eating up their product, your cute cats just devouring the dry kibble like no cat ever does. And, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> with gusto, like they must starve these cats. But anyway, so so. You turn over the label and you see all these confusing words like natural, organic, healthy. But when you really read the actual label and you see that they split up ingredients, so something's listed three different ways, so it won't seem like there's so much of it in there and very confusing. How do we know? I mean, is it okay to to feed the meals? Is it okay to to go for grain free? Like, what are we supposed to be doing when we look at these labels and we pick our dog and cat food nowadays? Dog and cat food, huge topic. And it's sort of almost like wearing masks and having discussion about whether masks are good or bad because it becomes an emotional argument rather than a factual argument. So let's just briefly talk about some of the advertising that you mentioned. So holistic, that seems to be a word that everybody likes to hear. It's a buzzword. It means nothing. It means nothing. In in the animal world, yeah. In the animal world with the definition, every food on the market is considered holistic. Holistic, Everybody can use that word. Organic is another word. So if if at least 95% of or so of the ingredients by content, by weight are organic, they can actually call it organic. But Mm -hmm. you have to take out water and salt. And so... It turns out to be not a lot. It needs to be organic to call it organic. Or then they'll say it will think, or they'll hedge their words and say that most of it is organic or organic ingredients. And all they need is about is over 70% of that one ingredient needs to be organic so they can say organic. What the advertising companies are trying to do is catch people's attention. So grain-free, there's been no data to whatsoever to show that grain-free is a good is a good idea, but there's lots of data now. To show it's a bad idea, right? Bad yeah, idea. bad idea. So we start thinking, okay, we're going to put our dogs on keto. We're going to not give them any grain. That's not the way to go, people, is give your dog heart problems. Don't do that. And so they're really just trying to catch people's attention and make themselves stand out. It's no different than raw. There's absolutely no data to support the raw food. Tons of data to show that it's not good. Well, and if you have little kids putting their fingers in dishes of raw foods and and kissing animals after they've eaten raw foods, you're nuts. That's not good. That's not good for the little kids or the immune compromised person who lives with you like grandma. It's not a hundred percent. So really, it boils down to sort of three categories of foods that people do or don't want to feed. There's the commercial food there and they range in quality. Then there's a veterinary therapeutic foods. And then you can do home cooked and. So those sort of the three classes of foods. When you decided to choose which one to do, the vast majority of our pets can do very, very well on a good commercial diet. And commercial diets vary between canned and dry. And again, you can break out which one is better. It's not really which one is better or worse. It's 
which one do you want to feed? Which one do you want to carry? Which one do you want to pay for? Because generally speaking, canned diets cost more because you're paying for more water, but the animals tend to like it more. It looks more like real food for people. So people feel better to feed it. What about a combination of dry with a bit of wet and some water? Exactly. You can do both. Okay. You can absolutely do both. But will, will it hurt their teeth if they're like a cat canned only gets soft? Don't, yeah, canned foods generally don't clean their teeth as well as dry. But okay. when you're trying to decide which of the foods to feed, it's a couple of things that I like to look for. Number one, does the company you're looking at, do they have a, nutri- a veterinary nutritionist, a board certified veterinary nutritionist formulating their foods? Because if they don't, then they're having to formulate their foods using someone else's information. Mm-hmm. Who formulates their foods? Some of the bigger companies will use, like, there's four companies that I really like. I'm not married to any of them. I'm not supported by any of them, but Hills, Purina, Royal Canin, you can do, but these companies do a ton of research. Well, what other companies will do is take their research to formulate their diets, which is not necessarily a terrible thing, but it's important to know where your company that you're going to support and buy their food and feed to your pet, where they're getting their information from what kind of quality controls are involved in the production of their foods? What kind of product research do these people do? Like if you look at those four companies I mentioned, they maintain colonies of animals that they're feeding these dogs. They live in in amazingly enriched environments and they're always tweaking and testing to get the best possible products they can. When you're looking at a label, a bit more detail now, is the food complete and balanced? It will say that on the label. If it does not, then it is not complete and balanced and it's more of a treat than a food. Even more refined, is it a life stage food? I prefer to feed puppies puppy diet. I prefer to feed large breed puppies, large breed puppy diet. I don't think one food satisfies all the life stages of most of these dogs, especially when you're dealing with the extremes. So if you have a great Dane or even a, a big golden doodle, puppy golden doodle is not a chihuahua. Yeah, And it's going to be growing longer, the mineral and vitamins that it needs, The ratios are very more specific for different periods of time. So life stage foods are important. There are governing bodies that require certain minimum standards for foods to achieve, to get there okay. AFCO is the most common one. And all these products, if they're really well formulated, will have an AFCO label on it. If it doesn't, the question is why? Mm -hmm. How many calories are in a cup or a gram of your food? Because if you're going to feed it, how much to feed? Because as you see on a regular basis, I'm sure... Most of the foods that aren't well formulated make the dogs fat. And yeah. a lot of these companies take, it's, it's okay if they make your dog heavy because then your dog won't starve to death. Whereas if you follow a feeding guide that's not quite adequate, then that's their fault. If your dog gets fat when you're feeding it, it's your fault. So they overrepresent how much to feed. This is where your vet comes in. When you ask them, this is what I'm feeding. This is how many calories are in a cup of my food. I've done my research. I really want to feed it. How much do I feed? Your vet can now tell you, because they need to know that how many calories per cup. Another really thing that I like when you're trying to choose a food company is, can you reach them? Can you call? Is there a number or an email Mm -hmm. where you can say, I bought a bag of food and this is the problem I'm having. Another reason why I like these four B companies is they have excellent communication and client helplines. Like, so all the, I've been feeding this food for two years and all of a sudden my dog won't touch it. Well, a lot of these companies will help you with that and give you alternatives or options. And they will maybe... It's possible maybe that food turned bad. It wasn't stored properly. And so I really like having a communication between the company you're purchasing it from and you and not not the wall of silence when you send questions. And the final thing I look at is who actually makes the food. Purina makes their food. Hills makes their food. Royal Canaan makes their food. A lot of these other companies will utilize third-party manufacturers to make their food because manufacturing food is expensive. Does it mean if they do this, it's a bad thing? Not necessarily, but when you're trying to decide what you want to feed, in my opinion, these are sort of the criteria you want to go from that you can apply to any company to help you determine quality, service, and even something as much as what their environmental footprint is. Some of these companies, people talk about being environmentally responsible. Well, if you look at how dry food is made and transported versus canned food, the canned food production has a much bigger environmental footprint or a carbon footprint than a, than a dry food. And so it really depends on how deep you want to go when you're trying to make this decision. But I find if you kind of follow these guidelines, when you're looking at the commercial foods, you will really be able to come up with the most informed choice that works for you. How's that? What about the meal? Is meal a bad thing? 
Chicken meal is not meal. necessarily a bad thing at all. No, actually, it's okay. not. It's actually a very inexpensive or a less expensive way to get the a high quality ingredient that can be quite digestible. For instance, corn, mm -hmm. a very inexpensive source of carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals, has a terrible rap in the pet food industry. People really think corn is one of the worst possible allergens that could be in most foods, when the reality is that's not true. Something along the lines like soy and beef are way more allergenic or dairy than corn. But because corn has the wrap that it has, people want to avoid it. So meat meal, while it is different from meat specifically in the way you define it, doesn't mean it's bad. It means that what we've done is taken a product and formulated it in a way that is very digestible. And another way of getting the protein that we want in an animal's diet, that is at a price point that more people can afford. Because it's a balance between quality of the ingredient digestibility, and what people can afford. In my opinion, the best possible food you can feed your pet is something you make yourself at home. Right. It is a lot more time consuming, but you have complete control of the ingredients provided you follow a recipe done by a veterinary nutritionist. And there's some excellent websites out there where they have these um, diet calculators where you can put in your own ingredients and um, they will give you how to formulate your food. It's actually not hard, you guys. You, it's a crock pot and a stew, basically. It's Pretty not much. hard. And you can freeze it. And you can take some of it and spice it up and make it for yourself after you've Absolutely. taken out the dog's part. Plus, you can use it like the way I use canned, a couple of spoonfuls with some water, throw it into the dry, mix it all together. Now the dog has a sloppy, warm, delicious meal. And mommy okay. loves it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go to break and come back and talk about doggy Alzheimer's. Stay tuned to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. Molly, here's your dinner. <laughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. This is a strange topic. Sometimes dogs, when they get old, they get confused. They'll forget things, like they'll go out and check the perimeter of the yard over and over and over, or feel a need to and want to and be very, very restless or uh, all kinds of things. They'll disturb their owners in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's a vision issue. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's actually senility. So what do we do about that, Dr. Jory? This has been a sort of evolving problem over the last decade simply because our dogs and cats are living a lot longer. And so when Labradors used to be very old at 10 or 11, now they're being 15, 16, 17. And so we are definitely seeing these cognitive behaviors I personally already have an almost 14-year-old golden retriever who walks into the room and gets lost standing in the yeah. middle of the room, or mm. she'll sit and bark at nothing. And it's an unfortunate but normal stage of aging. And there are some things we can do. Like what I try, what I see more commonly in my clinic is the anxiety associated with the cognitive loss. Right. And so that usually manifests at night when everyone's trying to go to sleep and the dog's pacing, panting, pacing, panting, or, you know, again, the barking and the wandering. And so there are certain sort of medications we can try, certain nutritional supplements to try. And then I also try to do things like environmental enrichment and exercise. So if you've got an older dog who has a really hard time settling, getting that walk in in the evening can really be helpful because you're, you're with them, you're stimulating them, and they're exercising. So now they're actually tired as opposed to this old dog who sleeps all day until everyone gets home. Now everyone's home and it's stimulated but it's slept all day. So it's really not right. that tired, you know? So I really think the environmental enrichment is probably one of the, if not the most important for these older animals so that they can stay on their nighttime, daytime routine and get the exercise that they need. So they're actually tired. 
There are nutritional things. Both Hills and Purina have cognitive dysfunction foods out there that are fortified with certain amino acids and antioxidants that they bound that really help cognition. I find the restlessness at night problem can really be helped by a perimeter walk. So what I mean to say is a lot of dogs feel like they are responsible for the security of the house. But as they get older, they, there's like, they can't remember. Did I check? Did I check? Is there an intruder? Did I check? And they, it just really bugs them. Like, you know, when you're older and you can't remember, did I lock the car? Did I lock the car? I don't know. Did I lock the house? It's that kind of a feeling. So if you take your dog out at the same time every night before everybody goes to bed and you literally on leash walk your perimeter. If it's a backyard that's exposed to a ravine, that's going to be the area he's worried about. Just walk along the fence line, let him or her pee and visit the fence and see that there's no intruder before bed. That will help so much. Another thing is nightlights. Dogs don't see that well when they get really, really old, and it really adds to their confusion. So if you put up little nightlights that go on, at least they're not bumping into everything as they try and navigate the stairs. And I do find stairs are something that when a dog's suffering with the senility, it's like they almost forget what they're for. So they'll go up and down the stairs, no problem all day long. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of it all, they'll be stuck upstairs and forget how to come down. They just don't know what they're for anymore. It's a really odd thing to witness, but it might be a good idea to stop your dog from having access to the stairs. Put up a baby gate if this is happening to you. But have you got anything else to add for Alzheimer's and senility and dogs and cats? One of the things that we don't want to also attribute senility for too is sometimes they're just sore. Like people say, oh, they're old, they're slowing down. No, their dogs don't slow down. Cats get weaker and painful. And so sometimes they do the stairs all day, but then the end of the day, they're like, I can't do it. My back is hurt. I, I'm just not doing it. Mm. And so get them in to get checked because if they're painful, quality of life improves dramatically when the pain goes away. And there's lots of options. Um, as far as relaxing at night, sometimes they get sundowning like syndrome where they kind of get their days and nights reversed. Talk to your vet, but melatonin can sometimes be quite helpful for that. Or there's another medication called gabapentin can be helpful for that. Sometimes evening things like certain other nutritional supplements can be very, very helpful. Like milk thistle can also really be helpful because it helps kind of clear the liver, get things flowing through that. So the liver is better at detoxifying the things that build up. So there's, there's lots of things that can be done. It really is done. But I, but in my older dogs, I like to do things in very tiny steps, small mm -hmm. things, look at for the big things first, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they can see. So they're not blind, make sure they're not painful. And once you turn them, knock those things off. And if we're still having issues, then what can we do to help them relax the, the environmental enrichment, pro, patrol your perimeter, let them know that they're comforter, comfortable and confident. I really love the nightlights. Yeah. And then add other things, perhaps at that point, to help them relax. It's sort of a, a small stepwise fashion to try to get to the recipe that works, recognizing it as they get older, the recipe will probably need to be adjusted. If your dog doesn't seem to hear so well anymore, you might want to put a bell on him. So at least you know where he is <laughs> and you can use a leash at first to teach him to look at you. So you could start teaching him hand signals. I like to teach hand signals when they're puppies. So their whole life long, if they lose their hearing or there's a loud train or something, they can still receive a command from me at a distance. But if you didn't do that and your dog's getting old, well, put him on a leash and just sort of Gently tug the leash so he looks at you every once in a while so you can he can receive the command. If he's close enough to hear, you can say it as you show the, the hand signal and then he'll know it. Because you know what? They want communication, even though they might not be able to hear as well or see as well. They still want to be kept in the loop. They want to know what's going on. So they want you to keep talking to them and communicating and keep taking them on walks and do things. You may have to slow down a bit. Maybe not go out at noon during a heat wave, but they still want to be part of your life. So don't just warehouse them all day and then expect them to be quiet at night. I think that's a really good point, Dr. Joy. And just recognize that we all get older and all they need yeah. is usually just a little bit more TLC and don't necessarily brush it off as age. Really make sure that they can see, that they can hear, and they're not uncomfortable. I think those three things can be life-changing for these oldie goldies. You know, also, I find little things like a heating pad or the self-warming blankets, all the kind of things help so much with dogs who are sore. They appreciate all these little, if your dog gets cold and wet, dry it off. Don't make it sit in the damp and wet when it's old and it has sore hips. You know, little things like that make such a difference. 
Absolutely. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us today, Dr. Joy. That was a packed show. Totally fun. I hope we helped a lot of people. And I know you're going to go on to help some people in Toronto today with some sick animals. Make them all well. That's pretty much where I'm going in about five minutes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for joining us and to everybody out there at Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.